Benvenuti. Welcome. Complimenti anche perché And congratulations. I read your bios. Really interesting. So you have an anaerobic digester in your farm. Well, the strategy is that you combine agroecology and bioenergy. So um, you have set this process in motion. We call it biogas done right with a number of benefits on several levels. Well, in terms of cash flow, because uh, we have capital to invest. Um, well, yeah, many people might believe you have gone on holiday to the Maldives, but you have reinvested in innovation, really. So it's interesting to see how this choice has um, made it possible. To um, um, contribute to the synergy. So please uh, tell us about your farm. Uh, two minutes each, if you can. Um, let's talk about what you do rather than what you have done in terms of innovation. Then we're going to talk about that. So the strategy of biogas done right implies a number of options. Uh, it's, it's not said that everyone can do everything from the start, but it's a journey. So let's start from that. Let's start from telling us about your farms. So uh, Serena, I don't know if you want to get started. Tell us about uh, the experience of your cooperative. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Chib for um, giving me the opportunity to represent the Cooperativa Speranza today, which is a cooperative that was founded in 1974 for um, um, the production of meat from uh, cattle raised in our farm. We have uh, 1,000 hectares, 80% for double crops. And we um, um, have 1,600 heads. Um, in 2008, we decided to launch a first um, anaerobic digester. And uh, since this, we loved this adventure and we believe very much in the system, in 2010, we have built the second digester. You can talk about that in a minute. Let's try to understand what your farms do. And then we will see how you have innovated and what benefits um, um, you have brought. So the effort is to translate theory that Rotolan talked about scientifically into practice. So it's good to see young people that have um, embarked on this journey with great courage. So, Gloria, tell us about your farm. What do you do? Good morning. So, our um, uh, farm was established in 71. Well, um, uh, my father was a cattle breeder from uh, Tombolo. Um, um, it's not far from, uh, from Venice. My grandfather bought the land in, um, in the post-war period, period. We um, um, have um, uh, cattle breeding and we have uh, cereals, 250 hectares. We have calves and cows. And we also have a composting um, plant. So we were actually um, disposing of green waste from um, public green areas, from um, um, neighboring um, towns and municipalities. For Francesco, tell us about what you do. Good morning. I'm Francesco Crivelli. I represent Castellana. Um, it's a farm that was established by my grandparents. Um, we have swine breeding, two uh, biogas plants and uh, photovoltaic plants. Uh, we um, grow crops on a thousand hectares, more or less, and that's it. And we use the heat um, uh, from biogas to heat up the stables. 
Grazie mille Francesco. Thank you Francesco. Stefano, what do you do in Molinella with your farm? Good morning, I'm Stefano Pasini. I'm a member of this farm with my brother and my father. In 2009, we decided to open a biogas plant, and in 2012, we opened a second one. We also have a milk cow breeding farm, and uh, we started um, um, opening a dryer um, for drying digestate, and uh, we also produce manure. So we uh, have a clearer picture of what you do. So how has your business changed when you started with biogas done right? So diversification of food crops, integration of biogas, investments in precision farming, um, mini tillage and new technology, development of organic fertilization, and sustainable intensification of uh, crop rotation with uh, double crops and um, leguminous crops. So this is the menu. What are you going to choose from that? What have you done already? And what are you planning on doing? So let's start from here again, from you. So what are the first steps that you have taken amongst all these that I have mentioned? So after building two biogas plants, we uh, cooperated with CAPAC, which is a cooperative uh, dealing with uh, drying cereals. And uh, so we can uh, use uh, waste, and this is an added value. Moreover, we had very important cooperation with the institute, um, with, the, with the Cancer Institute, Breast Cancer Institute, and we um, provide heating, which means one million fuel of fossil origin that is not used, 11 tons of CO2 that have not been emitted into the atmosphere. That's a big saving for them. So you haven't turned a blind eye on uh, on this question. What have you been doing? You're not keeping a low profile. You, you're definitely not. We have a PV plants on the stables. After um, uh, reclaiming asbestos from the roots, and for the future, we are planning of building a new plant for the production of biomethane uh, for transportation. So, you, full cycle, yes, that's what we are planning on doing. Thank you. So let us move on and let us see if we can interact. You might have some things in common, but I'm sure there are also differences. Um, so we are lucky that we are very close to this institute, two kilometers, um, and all our lands are around it. Uh, and the municipality was very much very supportive, so we had no difficulties in implementing this project. Well, the first biogas system was built in 2005, and it was really one of the first. We, we do not know much about it, so we did have difficulties. We started with 350 kilowatts to then, over the years, to get to 999. Unfortunately, unlike them, we were unable to use hot water for district heating because we were too far from the, the, the village. But we wanted to use this hot water. And one of the main problems we had at the farm was that a part of building uh, an headquarters was 60 kilometers from the biogas plant. So we thought of creating a, um, a desiccator. And so we thought of uh, using it so that it adjusts it could be used also in the various fields. We could not do that with lorries. Um, thanks to the biogas plant, uh, we reduce as much as possible the cost of fertilizers and chemical products. Uh, and uh, with double crop, we can also reduce uh, soil erosion because, of course, since the soil is always covered, uh, there is this advantage. And uh, even though we should not know this, uh, the double crop does not uh, deplete the soils because we bring back uh, all the elements back to the soil itself. 
And this is something we should all understand. We reduce CO2, and we are also thinking of developing liquid biomethane for uh, trucks with a CO2 reduction because we would turn it into liquid CO2. And um, so in the plant, uh, we want to build, we are about 4.5 million CO2 recovered, which is not mm, small. And I see that you also managed to make significant investments in terms of innovation, machinery, and plants. So, what well, you were telling us, well, the, um, the um, investments we made, well, we changed all our machinery, machines in our plant, in our farm, even too much in a sense. But we are getting to agriculture 4.0, in which entails also a decrease in terms uh, of. Uh, um, of um, fuel for trucks, etc. There's also the aspects of the desiccator that includes also biomethane. All the stables were refurbished, and we must also, um, even though we are a bit late, we are also going to place solar cells on our roofs. So you too are trying to act uh, um, on a long run basis. Yes, we're talking about a 10 million euro investment. So, well, you didn't go on holiday to the Maldives, that's sure. Well, no, but uh, we have bought a bigger, you know, engine to move about the farm. But anyway, as far as biomethane is concerned, what I think I hope I can bring home is to, and I'm working on it, is that to close this cycle. And we have been working with municipal companies, particularly with the um, municipality of of Venice because we would like our liquid methane to be used by uh, the vessels in uh, Venice, uh, um, the uh, ferries. It would be nice also to do that in Padua. You can come and speak to us, but in that city, it would be really great to be able to reduce the carbon footprint, footprint because some people don't realize that even uh, uh, on uh, cruises uh, and ferries, the amount of uh, exhaust waste uh, gases, um, the amount is really, you know, great, and people sometimes don't realize that. So let us move on, Francesco. Tell us what you did in your farm. So what were the first steps? What do, when? Well, with the biogas. Ours was one of the first to start, so we started with one megawatt in 2007-2008, and then a second system was built two years later. And uh, after we built these biogas plants, was to enhance the digestate as much as possible because this is this is seen in our farm as a great resource. So investments that we made were. Um, may not to waste this uh, product, which for us is the digestate. So we have a tank to distribute the digestate, and then uh, we have some pie, some connections with uh, this other tank. That, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know much about these things, so can you explain a bit more? This umbilical ba cord based system, I'm sorry, I've never heard about it. I, you know, would like to come out of this conference with some additional learning because I'm sure that you know all these things, but of course, you also have to think about us people who don't know anything. Well, it's a system that distributes the digestate uh, below the ground, which is connected. Perhaps there are some pictures. It's connected to a pipe, so it allows you to distribute below the ground in a controlled way. So we know how many cubic meters we are bringing into the soil. And uh, so without going with um, tanks uh, over the, um, the fields, we will make the soil more compact, and this would not be ideal. Uh, so this way of using digested in an intelligent, in a smart way allowed us to 
for instance, reduce the purchase of chemical fertilizers and also the use of uh, chemical fertilizers. <coughs> um, and uh, we farm 1,000 hectares and uh, we have some 400 hectares that we where we have double crops. Um, we have this uh, biomethane challenge. We are going to start next uh, year. We're going to launch this new project. We are very, you know, we have great hopes f for biomethane and we want to rise up to this challenge very willingly. Uh, but well, there are many people who are optimistic in this sense. It, this is one of the main challenges uh, and also a ba big opportunity. I always want to speak about the environment as an opportunity. So if we want to you know, be a bit self-critical, uh, in the past decades was that the environmentalists always spoke about the, prob the, the environment as a problem. And this, of course, is something that you know, uh, is not the right way to look at nature because it's rather an opportunity to create uh, jobs, uh, protect the environment, protect health, promote democracy and peace because there too, if you become autonomous also from an energy, energetic standpoint or going in that direction is also essential f in terms of geopolitical peace. And that is why Ratalal is so focused on peace because one third of wars on the planet have been fought and are fought for fossil fuels. So going in this direction, becoming autonomous is really essential. And I just wish to add something. I think it is crazy that we need to import energy as if we didn't have enough in Italy. Now, I understand importing what does not exist here, like copper uh, or aluminum uh, from you know African countries or from South America. We don't have it, of course. If you buy it, then you would have to recycle it. But anyway, but energy, we are saying that in Italy we do not have energy and we need to import it, uh, over 80% of it from abroad. It doesn't make sense because energy is all around us. We just need to, you know, channel it, store it, uh, make it usable. And in this connection, uh, the biomethane and biogas technology allows you to make plants to plan f for the future. And it has an additional advantage compared with uh, solar power or wind power. This is only comparable uh, with the hydroelectric power in terms of the ability to plan it out. So I'm quite glad they start speaking about opportunities. We must stop speaking about environmental issues, problems. They are a problem just if we make the wrong choices. And it is a trap because when we feel that we are before, you know, a crossroads. Do you want to support the economy or you want to protect the environment? Do you want to promote jobs or protect health? Um, do we really want to think about the south of the world with all the problems that we've got at home? Well, this is really a misconception because the truth is, is that we can do all things at the same time and the only choice that we have is between wise choices and Luca has highlighted and underscored this theme, this uh, word, or choices, and we want to get back to the girl, little girl's word that bring about damage uh, from all perspectives. We can put together economy, uh, jobs, the environment, health, uh, and the strategy of Bagas Don Right that puts together energy, culture, and production goes uh, courageously in this direction. So we can move on, and then perhaps we can get back to you as well. So the last uh, speaker uh, is Stefano. Can you tell us what you did in Molinella with your farm? Yes, we, after the first biogas plant, we exploited heat in a fodder desiccation plant and then we built a second plant and all the heat from the plant was channeled to a, a desiccator for digestate. And then uh, from there, we decided to enhance the digest state, uh, making pellets out of it and selling it as uh, organic uh, fertilizer to distribute to uh, agrarian consortia uh, and a network uh, sales network that we created to so bring it back to the earth what we took from it. So a series of action. I think that on the screen we can see some pictures and you can see really, you, can, you know, impressive data also concerning 
the investments that were made thanks to this strategy. I don't think you could have found these resources to invest in innovation and protect the environment without all this. No, it's true thanks to the biogas plants. We made these investments because we had the chance to do them. Otherwise, we could not have spent all this money. Also because, uh, you know, the added value is being taken from the producer through these chains. I dealt with fair trade for a long time, and I remember that we were breaking down the price, uh, let's say, uh, of a banana. And when we broke the price down, we we realized that when you took into account all the various, you know, steps, what was left to the producer was really something ridiculous. And now, and we have looked, now we see that the same percentages are mirrored also by uh, production in our own country. So when on our tables we get uh, an apple from Chile or from Northern Italy, and, and uh, if you don't want to lower prices and reduce rights, this strategy is essential. Uh, I'm really sorry when I see fruit that is not collected also close to where I live because just because the crop, well, collecting this fruit would be too expensive. So it's a real waste. It's a folly to see all this fruit going rotten. You know, throughout history, there was always the opposite problem. We never left produce rot. So on the one hand, you've got people who are starving, and on the other, you do not you know, c collect fruit because the market does not allow you to do that. So if we were to analyze this strategy just from an energy standpoint, we would not really focus on uh, on what is important. I'm glad that the agriculture minister is here and uh, the CIB and myself, we really want to focus on this because giving the chance of not wasting what is a heritage of our agricultural sector is important. I will I will make an example is that of silk. Uh, silk represented almost 30% of Italian exports, 30% up until some eight years ago. So do you realize how much that was? And it disappeared for two main reasons, Mr. Zonta was telling me. First of all, the environmental issue related to uh, uh, pollution because uh, this type of uh, industry is very sensitive and um, so silkworm is very sensitive and because of Chinese competition. So don't we want to make sure that other industrial chains are, are lost? We want, do we want to make sure that they are not lost, uh, other, other industrial chains, in order to protect our farming, not just climate, but also production chains? Otherwise, we end up not being competitive compared with international markets. Um, and I am thinking about the, you know, strikes and battles uh, of the Sardinian uh, uh, sheep, grow, uh, sheep uh, as well. So, but are we ready to pay those prices, sheep shepherds? Anyway, so can you imagine your company without a biodigester? Can you, you know, make a leap of imagination? Of course, this is not what I wish for you, but try to imagine if tomorrow you had to switch your digester down well. No doubt the farm, also because my we focused everything around the biogas plant also to exploit heat and the digester. We, everything would stop in terms of investments and also in terms of the future generations. I would not be unable to give a job to my own children and the children of our workers and the future generations. So it's unimaginable. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So the same is for me and I think for everyone. So but what would happen specifically in your own comp farm? We're not just talking about theory, I would like to know what in your, would happen in your farm where today the biogas plant is part of La Castellana. If we didn't have it, probably also the cattle breeding would be affected, first of all, uh, because there was this merger between the plant and the cattle breeding activity. So we take all the effluents, uh, then they are treated in the biogas plant, and then they are brought back to the farmland, but then 
then we recover heat from the biogas plant that has become a resource for cattle breeding because we managed to save in financial terms and also in terms of emissions because we eliminated fossil fuel based boilers um, so I you know without it I can't even imagine what my farm would be also because when I arrived in it when the plant was being built so but I could not even imagine it without it no not even with a leap of the imagination no that wouldn't be impossible um, so let us do that in your case well I'm not telling you what would happen I'm telling you what would have happened well if I speak about my own company the plant was created in 2005 and two years before my father from his brother had bought half of the farm with a big, you know, financial investment. And I remember when uh, at the time we created the biogas plant, I told my father, are you crazy? Another investment. We can't even pay the other one. And you're thinking of making another. And he told me, well, you may not have understood without the biogas plant, we're not going anywhere. <coughs> And there I was thinking, when I was young, a, a kid that was 12 or 13, I, I liked making voices. And I remember that we sold uh, meat at 3,800 lira, 4,200 lira. Now we sell it at 2 euros, 2 euros and 20. So it's unthinkable because raw material has increased, um, manpower has increased taxes have increased, um, it's, it's cannot be phased. It's true, um, many committees from the village came to see me at the plant, they were against the biogas plant, they said it's polluting, they used to say it creates damage. They would come and I was there, you know, to explain, because if I explain this, uh, they can understand. And first thing they told me was, how much do you earn? And I use, and I was explaining to them, let us understand what a biogas plant is and then what how much I earn. Because we have to understand, without the biogas plant, the farm companies cannot survive. And I think that a farm company, a farm, must be able to be sustainable without the common agricultural policy, uh, without contributions. We have to stand on our own feet. We have to be autonomous. We must help farms to make investments in order to be able to continue in the future by themselves, walk uh, on, stand on their own feet. This is the first thing. Then. And, you know, I'm very passionate about this because it drives me crazy. Um, and I forgot to say that we have an authorization for Category 3. It's the waste of agri-farm produce, what cannot be used. Well, here too, it seems as though we are there polluting. Well, allow me to say, my father taught me something. Perhaps I think he loves the soil, the, the earth more than I than he loves me, and now I understand him. So if we realize that we love the earth, our farmers love it, we would never take things away from our land. It's like our children. Uh, with these plants, we want to pamper the soil, the land. That is what we want to do, and we can also do that with the food industry by using their waste so that it does not become pollution, but it becomes a resource within our plants. Well, listening to you, you spoke about your love for lands and nature, and I have a question. Uh, I'm an educator. How can you love something that you do not know and that you never go to? or? There was a study published last year saying that our children, this was conducted on school, elementary school children, they spend less time outside than prisoners in prisons who have to stay outside at least two hours. If you think about our children, they leave school, well, they leave home, they, they go into the car, they go to school, they leave the school, they go back into the car, they get back home, and, they, and that's what they do. Then they go to the gym. Uh, and then they come back home. So how many minutes have they been outside every day? This, unfortunately, is something very common. An elementary school class who goes to a teacher didactic farm. 
this is quite dramatic. Anyway, um, so four fourth grade kids go to this farm, then they come home and they say, wow, it was great, there were all these animals. So we looked at the donkey, we made jam, a great experience. The only thing is that at one point we saw a hen who only had two, hand, two uh, poles. She was, I don't know, lacking the rest of uh, the legs. And her mom was saying, what are you talking about? Well, this kid, because he or she had never seen a hen, a hen, a chicken, she always saw, you know, the, the this uh, thing uh, at the supermarket, and they, you know, they saw the chicken had at least, I don't know, a, various legs. So this is what the situation is. So we have to help our children try and understand nature um, and uh, know what it is, otherwise they will never be able to love it. So a kid comes out of the bus crying, and he said, well, they told me that here there were cows and there are just sheep, but there are just sheep. Yes, because the cow is purple. Oh, yes, this is what happens. Okay, well, I, I give up, I give up. Uh, I mean, this is even worse than the chicken with, the, I don't know, eight legs. Um, yes, what about this question? What would have happened, or what would happen, what would have happened if you had not uh, set up your uh, plant, or you have to close it, if you had to close it down tomorrow? Well, I think that biogas was a great opportunity for us farmers. Uh, and I want to underscore this aspect because this is, we have to invest in our future. Uh, we have a task, all citizens have it, but we farmers particularly have it, and this, we are custodians, protectors of the environment. We have to enhance it, and uh, we have to use it, of course, but we have to enhance it and protect it. And I think that biogas granted us this opportunity as well, using, not, not just using it, but creating a cycle whereby what is taken from the land is given back to it with a surplus, which is the digest state, uh, because it allows you not to use uh, fertilizers, as we were saying. Um, and in addition, this allows you to increase organic matter in the soil. That is a very important task, in other words, uh, retaining water. So this means that if the water, if the soil retains more water. You need less water to irrigate, which is one of the main reasons why we farmers are attacked and why we are criticized and why people are so doubtful about what we do in our farms. And uh, we were very lucky as well because the administration was always in favor of our plants, Bagas plants, and in favor of our projects. And therefore, we every year decided to host uh, junior high school students to f for them to visit our plants and the farm because if out of 20 children I manage even just to convince three to undertake this profession or that we do is respectful for the environment and it's actually something beneficial to the environment and that we are doing something for the community, well, then I think I'm already a winner because these three young boys and girls will speak with somebody else and they will convince somebody else as well. I personally am very much convinced that we should share our work uh, and we do use a lot the social networks, uh, perhaps because we are, you know, young in this cooperative. But I am very, I'm a very strong supporter of the social networks to produce, to explain what we do, how we raise a cattle and animals, how we make remote, uh, district heating and all the things that we do. We have some 500 uh, students coming to visit us every year, coming from all over Europe. And uh, it's very exciting to speak with them, particularly when, uh, you know, they are young, your age, and they do not know your world, and uh, you explain it to them, and they really appreciate it. So for us, this is very, very important. And Biogas also gave us this opportunity, in other words, the ability to share with society what we do with the citizens. And personally, uh, 
our village has got 6,000 inhabitants. We produce biogas, and all the people who uh, are in the village, they come and get digested uh, free of charge to use it in their own plots of land because then the grandfather tells his grandchild, no, oh, you know, I went to the farm, and then they come back with their grandchildren. This is something that happens as well, but this is an added value, particularly for this reason, I think. So what you're saying, I think it's essential because we need to recreate our relationship with the environment and a sense of trust. So why the first question is how much you earn? Because there is this climate of mistrust, and we can understand why, whereby everybody, you know, do whatever they do is to gain something financially. When nobody does everything, anything, you know, for the others, just for the sake of it, for the benefit. And we need to reestablish a sense of trust. So the grandfather comes together, the judge said it's great, so the, you know, the school children, it's great. So instead of having committees coming to question what you're doing, you've got the, the, the opposite. I have to say that the junior high students, when they come to visit us, they come on foot. We've got a cycle path that connects us to the center of the village. So you, they walk five kilometers back and forth, but they do this very willingly. And I think that this is something I would like to underscore because it is something that I'm particularly fond of. It's very important for us to have a connection with the, with society uh, because we must make people understand that we have got goals in order to protect the environment and not to destroy it, as unfortunately uh, some people believe. A last question, 30 seconds. So if you had to put uh, a message in, in a bottle or well to, to be dug underground in this case. So what would you like to write in this message? So he is going to have to answer. First, what would you say in this message? So we are always lo used to looking at our own feet in the sense that we do not look to the future. My grandfather was a farmer. Uh, told my father, remember Silvano, if everybody is planting peaches, uh, you know, you, you remove them, and if they are doing the opposite, you, do, you know, if they are removing them, you plant them. So it's a courage of going against the mainstream, you know, not taking shortcuts, not being myopic. So if you had to place a message in this bottle that, in a bottle that is going to be opened in, I don't know, 100 years or 20 years' time, I don't know, look into the future, what would you write in it? This is a hard, a tough question. Well, I would write, uh, we did our best. Yeah, yes, that's uh, a good message. Well, try to think, um, if we get back to the analysis that Macaulay was illustrating, if everybody could write this in a bottle, you know, what would happen to the chart, Luca, if everybody could write you know, truthfully, this uh, message and put place it in a bottle, then we would, you know, sleep a bit more uh, soundly because we would feel safer. <laughs> well, good question, tough. Uh, you can copy from, uh, you know, your neighbor as we used to do in, in school. I didn't want to, you know, ask an excessively difficult uh, question. Yeah, I would write something about the environment. I don't know. With our, through our farm, we tried to do our best in order to protect the environment. So it's similar to what uh, he said. Yes, no, it's true. This is what we want to do, what we want to focus on. Well, yes, it's, um, it's this feeling that this feeling of him, everything being possible that bring us not to do anything, you become, you know, resigned. But if you, you know, promote hope uh, is essential. That is what allows you to, you know, make commitments. If you think that, you know, it's too late and you cannot do anything to change things, you will just try and live the rest of your life as in the best possible manner. But if you then think that you can do something, then it's another story. Well, I would write something like, um, if you want, you um, can, and uh, by acting together, you can achieve better results. Well, this is, yes, a slogan we could adopt. Um, I would write that everybody can play their parts and that uh, if you go alone, you go further, but if you go together, it is much better.